This is our first in-person program in quite a while, and we weren't expecting Woo, this much, this is great, and in our newly renovated space, so we can fit more of you in this space now, which is great, thanks for the renovation, so thank you, thank you. So I am Michaela Hall, I am the director of the library. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight, and I want to give a special thanks to Ray Uzanis. Can you give a round of applause to Ray? <laughs> he has put a lot of hard work into this program tonight. And I would also, hard work was getting up and back from there. Yes, but you will <laughs> you'll hear a lot about. And thank you to the rest of our staff and our volunteers for all their support in organizing this event. We can't do it without them. We are live streaming, so we have some new live streaming equipment. We're live streaming on our Facebook page tonight for those who can't join us. And we are going to upload the recording on our YouTube channel as well, so stay tuned for that. Now, to introduce Ray. The person you're here for tonight. Ray is a writer, a photographer, and a global adventurer who continues to travel the world in search of interesting and scenic regions rich in wildlife and cultural diversity. With this presentation, the Stonington resident shares his recent visits to Iceland with an emphasis on the currently erupting volcano. I am not going to try to pronounce the name, I leave that to Ray, and its extraordinary and otherworldly activity. Whether with his published lectures or books, Ray summarizes his intent simply as, I hope my photographs and my writing reasonably capture the best of nature's artistry as well as its inhabitants and that it will be of interest and value to others. And it certainly will. Thank you so much, everyone. Welcome, Ray. Take it yeah. over. That's good. Okay. Thank you, Michaela, and uh, thank all of you for coming. Uh, especially, uh, I don't know if you know it, right now in Fenway Park, there's a little bigger event going on. <laughs> and uh, I've got a couple of friends here that I'll bet had made bets among themselves as to where I would show up. But anyway, <laughs> I'm here for you. And I would like to promise you that when we get into the meat of this, I can generate as much excitement by what we'll be seeing as a Deborah's home run in Fenway. But we shall see. Uh, where, where I want to start, uh, I, I have a, uh, let's call it a mission to explain, to explain how a, um, an aging adventurer uh, on short notice would get on a plane, fly across the ocean in the midst of a global pandemic, Arrived the next morning, early. By the time we got through all the uh, issues of COVID and what has to go through for the protocols, it was already the end of the day. And he, along with a few fellow photographers, took off to the southwest part of Iceland. I'm going to change the thing here. This, this area here. And undertook a rather rigorous, uh, only a two and a half mile climb, but, uh, but given the state of the, of the trails, which you'll see shortly. Uh, after a couple hours, they made it to the top. It was already uh, near freezing. When they got to the top, 200 yards away, at this point, I'm going to just call it an exploding mountain. When the wind changed direction, little bits of lava came their way. Not good for the camera lens. After being up there for a couple hours, two, three hours, so it's middle of the night, now you've got to come down. Coming down, a lot harder than going up, especially given the condition of the trails. Does that not once, goes back a second time, and then a third time. Realizing that some of the other ones you couldn't go again because the trails were no longer there, they were covered with lava. So the person gets back home and he, and he describes it as the most exhilarating, gratifying, and not to say the least, humbling experience of his travels. So that's what I'm hoping we're going to follow through and you're going to understand why he felt why he feels that way. 
So where I'm going to start, I'm going to start at the, at the beginning for our purposes. This here, this is Reykjavik, the capital. This area here, uh, the Reykjani Peninsula, is a, is a mountainous area. Back in mid-March of this year, mid-March of this year, there was a series of uh, tremors, little mini er uh, earthquakes, but numbering in the thousands. In fact, I saw a, uh, I saw a fig, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, I saw a number that said like 40,000. No, they were obviously smaller ones. But what happened uh, in the course of, this was mid-March, and as it went through April, these uh, mini earthquakes uh, started causing uh, uh, volcanoes along the ridge line. There was maybe seven or eight fissures that had opened up. And as they, there's, you know, some lava flows, but nothing, nothing really of, of note. That, but as they continued, as the month continued into April, the fissures actually became less active, and there was maybe six or seven vents eventually coalescing into a single vent number five, which got the bulk of what was happening. Now, what was happening here was lava flows, extensive lava flows that um, was not of the, not of the type that uh, uh, Mount St. Helens, or let's say 10 years ago in Iceland, they had one where, the if you remember, all the international flights were, were interrupted. This was, this was not the ash and not the, the toxic smoke. This was the lava. So right about, right at the end of April, beginning, right at the beginning of May, I uh, was contacted by a photographer friend, somebody I had traveled with before, and he was, uh, had contacted a number of his clients to see who was interested in going over and, and checking out the volcano. Now, there were issues at the time. This is right at the beginning of May. You know, you had the issues with the, with the COVID. Um, you had, the, I forget, the volcano, these aren't predictable. Uh, this could have stopped, stopped erupting the next week. Uh, but the sense was that uh, he didn't seem to have much trouble getting six of us together. And two weeks later, we were in Reykjavik to begin our, our uh, adventure. Now, our timing, it turns out the timing was perfect. And I say that from the context that uh, a, a week later, a week later, conditions, the wind, the weather, uh, precipitation had dramatically changed which meant that the, you know, going, going to and from the, up the mountain became much more of a challenge. And about that same time, uh, there was a writer, an American writer, who went with a photographer and a guide. And she, she, she went up there, and she wrote a lengthy article, as are most articles in New Yorker, a lengthy article on, her, on that experience. It's in the August 23rd issue. It's a wonderfully written, very, very, excuse me, excuse me, very accurate depiction of the challenges they had in doing it. So from that standpoint, uh, again, our timing was perfect. Now, uh, the, that was the good news. Maybe the bad news, although I say this part a little tongue-in-cheek, if we had waited if we had waited another month or two, month or so, we would not have seen the activity level with the volcano, but more than likely we would have run into uh, Annie Leibowitz, who was doing, uh, she had a bevy of beauties with her, and she was doing a fashion shoot uh, for Vogue magazine. And actually the current issue of Vogue magazine uh, has, that, has that layout. And actually, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll just pass, you guys can pass it pass mm -hmm. around a bit. Uh, but what I found interesting on that, and it, it led to a, a little bit of a change here, uh, she had a, a series of photos, and they were taken, obviously the first, the lead photo was, was a model with the uh, volcano in the background. But the other ones, the other ones were, um, let me find my, 
what did I do with my pointer? <laughs> Excuse me. Hold on. I've got it. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's my age, please. Okay. Anyway. Uh, okay, I'm going to do this. Anyway, the photos taken, apart from the volcano, were taken in a lot of these more this more remote er the more remote areas of Iceland. Now let me just step back for a minute and just give you the briefest. Iceland's about the size of Maine. Population about a about a third of a million and two thirds of them are basically in and around uh, Reykjavik here, right around here. But her photos were done in various places out here. But it it uh, brought to mind uh, I went, I went to Iceland just a couple of years earlier with the same photographer. And what we did, we, this, this area around Reykjavik, I should point out, uh, most tourists, that, that's a highlight because there's a, what they call a golden circle. And it's about a 200 mile um, ride around the, uh, that area that highlights a lot of the best of Iceland. The, uh, you know, the, the waterfalls, the, uh, the, uh, the lagoons. The fumaroles, uh, uh, it, it really is a highlight. But getting out into this area uh, is quite, it, it's a forbidding, inhospitable. Uh, and the photos that, that, that she had as backdrops uh, were several of those. And it, it, it said to, suggested to me that uh, while we're going to be looking at concentrating on the volcanoes, you know, the Earth is, is maybe, you know, the Earth has this, this beauty to be found everywhere. You know, it's not just in grand waterfalls or, or canyons or snow-capped mountains. It can be any place. And I realized that I went back and looked at what I had gathered from my, my, my photos from that trip. And really, there were some wonderful uh, ones I'd like to share. Now, that's not, I'm going to take five or ten minutes right now. But I, what I want to do there is I want, I want you to experience what, what that part of Iceland is like before we get to the other. Now, for those of you, for those of you that maybe, you know, want to take a break or check on the Red Sox or whatever, you can do that. But you know, in the movies, they do trailers if we was the coming attractions. So I'm just going to run this, it's just a 50 second video. Fragdosiak, Mount Fragdosiak, that's the volcano. Fragdosiak. This was our first night. Okay, we will revisit that, but in the meantime, this is just a couple, this is Reykjavik, I just, this, this picture, two of them were taken in my first trip, this last one recently, just downtown Reykjavik, uh, just a photo I thought was, was interesting, I took it just because of the composition. This was actually on the, the trip I just got back from, this is, this is the probably the busiest should be the busiest street in downtown Reykjavik, but it was during the you know it was during the pandemic. This was a Saturday, and uh, had arrived Saturday morning. About having to be quarantined and all that, there wasn't much to do. But you can see there's very few people out there, so uh, did the walk and, and basically that was it. So that's enough of, of urban Iceland. So what we're going to do here, I'm showing this to you briefly. <laughs> We're going to make a road trip through these areas. I highlighted the names. Now, if you promise not to have me pronounce them, I promise not to have you remember them. <laughs> this would be this, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with anyone unless somebody sees something they want to look at. 
Uh, we're starting out. I actually actually climbed to the. Uh, whoops, sorry about that. Climbed up this little ridge to be able to uh, photograph our uh, caravan, if you would. And I want you. And I want you. You're know, coming along with me. We're going to be in. The, we'll be in a car. We'll be on foot. At one point, we'll be in a helicopter. Uh, but I, I would just want you to, uh, as best you can, just experience what it's like. And I was, I was telling Michaela before not to get off the subject, uh, but I happen to love the venue here because the type of things I do involving travel, I feel it's a small enough, intimate enough that if you make the effort, you can feel like you're there. It's not me being there, it's you being with me. And again, just going to go, I just want to give you a sense of, of the different terrains. This was in uh, September of uh, that past year. You can see a couple of our people off here. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, and color, color in different ways abounds there. The lichens and uh, the mineral contents there. Just a couple of close ups. Back on, back on the road. See, one of our photographers wanted to get up close and personal with a fumarole. But, you know, when you're looking at the pictures, look at them, just the color, the contrast, and what's going on. I mean, there's this beauty of all, of all kinds to behold. This picture, uh, this picture shot right as the sun was you know, coming, that's the western sky over there. The sun just coming up in the east here, you can see it catching the... Uh, the upper mountains. Uh, a few of us decided to go chasing the sunrise, sunset, I think this was. So I put this in only to, to suggest that it wasn't just us getting out of a car and taking a picture. There were several places along the way where you did some rather, you'll, you'll see them a little bit later too, some rather rigorous hiking to get to what you wanted to photograph. Uh, this is the uh, Icelandic horse. I'm sure there's people here know more about them than I do. I got them in there. They're, you know, there's a, a population of, what, 350,000 uh, Icelanders. The population of the horses is something like uh, 80,000. And, you know, they're an unusually uh, pure breed. And I understand, I have uh, friends and neighbors, uh, Ann and Chris, who have been to Iceland like a dozen times. So they've been kind of a quasi-encyclopedia for me. And I understand that uh, to maintain the, uh, the, the purity of the breeding, you cannot, if you're doing anything involving the horses, you cannot bring in anything into Iceland that isn't new. In other words, anything that's been around, used in any way with any other breeds of horses anywhere is just not allowed into the country. Uh, this scene was shot right after I was just coming back. It's probably about 11 o'clock at night. And... Uh, Happen to see that those appear whooper swans, and I just, I just thought it was a nice capture of the uh, of the sunset. Uh, now we're going off a coast. And now this is a part that we normally have some tourists. It's a, it's the uh, uh, black sand beaches with you can see you'll be able to see the icebergs breaking off. Very popular place. Fortunately for us, uh, because of the COVID and everything, there was very few visitors. And you see in this and this, no way we would have been able to take uh, pictures like this um, during the tourist season. This is right across the way into one of the bays. That's taken in this bay here. I just happened to catch that part of it. Uh, the puffin, this is, this is a terrible picture of a puffin. The only reason I have, they were actually all out to sea. The only reason I've got it in there, I just wanted to uh, uh, mention to you that uh, in talking about puffins, uh, Iceland has something like 8 to 10 million puffins that call it home, which represents about half the population of, uh, of Atlantic puffins. Uh, if anybody knows uh, Bill Hobbs or Maggie Jones, they're the experts on puffins. You want to know more? Talk to them. 
But anyway, uh, uh, it's an immense population that, is, that uh, calls Iceland home. Now we're going to take you up in a helicopter. This was, uh, this was this last time, actually. And uh, what we're going to do is the doors, you can see the doors off the helicopter were tethered in. And we're going to fly over uh, an area called uh, the Braided Rivers. Uh, and Braided River, there's, you know, because of the mineral content of the sediment and so forth, you get some interesting uh, perspectives. You can see it going out to sea in this direction. This, and uh, our, intent, our intent is to fly over areas like this and then um, get down closer and see if we can photograph some interesting abstract captures. And we're getting low, so these really aren't, you know, there's no big, tele no big telephoto lens involved here. And I probably got, you know, 50 of these. I just took a few just to give you a sense of what, uh, what you can do there. This is my favorite, actually. This actually was shot in the same one. It's, uh, this wasn't done in black and white. That's basically the black sand. Those are actually elephant seals off there. These, I just got this great. These are a whooper, whooper swans, they're called. They're the only swan in Iceland. <coughs> and uh, uh, the only point I would make on that is interesting. You know, we have here the mute swans, and, and most of those places had inherited or, or mute swans ended up there. But in the case of Iceland, uh, if, a, if a, a mute swan doesn't learn to migrate its first autumn season, it doesn't which means that it gets stuck in Iceland, and of course, given the winters in Iceland, food sources dry up, and it's my understanding that that's why mute fawns no longer exist in Iceland. Now we're going up to the northern part. Uh, it, this uh, craters here you know, have been extinct for maybe 2,500 years. Uh, you can see a, uh, I don't know why my thing doesn't work. You can see uh, down in this area a couple little, do little dots. Well, what those little dots are, <laughs> two people swimming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, it's not so much the swimming, but how did they get there? You saw what it looked like. But anyway, I waited around for them, uh, waited for them to come out, and they came out. It was actually a, uh, it was actually a, a is actually a Swiss couple, you know, you know in the 30s, and uh, they've been here before. You know, the sense of the scale of one of the craters. Um, you can see one of our people standing up top. Give the sense of the size and magnitude of it. These next three, these next three pictures basically weren't taken in black and white. That's that's basically what the uh, scenery was like up there. Life abounds everywhere. This this is what this is what you call a fog bow. Fog bow is created obviously by fog, and the uh, the droplets fog droplets are smaller than rain droplets, so you you won't get the intensity of the color that you get from a rainbow. But anyway, given the the uh, uh, landscape and so forth, I I really like this picture. Now we're going off to uh, check out a glacier, and I, I've got this in it just to show you that a lot of the, when you're out in those areas, uh, there's, not, there's not trails. You don't have trail markers. <laughs> you, don't, you know, you don't have uh, uh, paths that have been cleared by volunteers like uh, some of my friends that do a Fabaloni and Westerly Land Trust and all that. They're out there. And what we're doing is we're going, we're going to go over to this glacier, and we get down in there and took several pictures in here of the uh, of the glacier, and again, even there, the seeing the close up, the the beauty in the remote. This is uh, black sand. Look at uh, to me, that's uh, that's amazing. Uh, now we're going off. You know, hot springs are of course all over ice. And here's just going to be a few images of some of the hot springs you see in some of these 
more distant areas. This would have been taken near sunset, so even you've got that coloration, but it was accentuated by the, you know, the light. Uh, I mean, you know, I'm going to show you a few you know, waterfalls that kind of <laughs> waterfalls go along with Iceland. So I'm just uh, this is a, a river that's going to be running up. You'll see the falls in a minute. It's caught at, at sunset. I like the light that was coming through there. You can see one of our people posing up top there. We did a lot of walking around all this, and you know. Unlike in America, we got all kinds of guardrails and things for good reason, of course. Uh, around there, <laughs> there wasn't a heck of a lot to keep you from uh, tumbling in. You have to obviously be careful. Another one, you can see one of our people up there. And we go down to different levels. Spend, spend a lot of time. This picture, I, I, I got this actually for one picture that follows, really. Uh, this was our, this was our, our group leader, uh, Justin Black, and uh, he's photographing there. I'm actually, over, I'm actually over in this area here, which I uh, saw something up close, and I, I took this picture. I saw it going on, it was happening, you know, and uh, after I did it, I went, kind of went trepping tre tre through it. Never saw what it was. Nobody... Nobody could figure out what that was. But anyway, I just thought it was too interesting to pass up. Uh, these last two shots, these, these represent what I thought was probably the most, I shouldn't say it because I know our, our tour leader will probably be hearing this, but I didn't feel it was the most responsible thing that we could have done. It's spectacular. There's no question about it. And you look at close up, you can see, you can see the one. But what you have to, what you don't, well, you, of course, you can see the, the trail. You can see in there, you can see that there's no, no fallback position. <laughs> um, but what you, oops, I'm sorry, what you're not seeing is, don't forget, we're carrying cameras. Uh, we've got our tripods with us. And I would say that conservatively, we estimated that there was at least 50 to 60 mile an hour winds blowing. Now, to be on that ridge under those conditions, to me, was crazy. But you know, I'm here to talk about it. So, but this is a this I I, I can't pronounce the name of it. Uh, Ian, you probably know the name. No, <laughs> okay. Anyhow, uh, this was the, you know no question the beauty the stark beauty of it is just you know. But you can actually see if you look down you can see stairs in the lower right as a way to get you know get going up there too. Uh, we're finishing up here on that. These are the you know, lenticular clouds that form over the uh, over the mountains, especially later in the day. Okay, so that uh, again, I would, that was just to give you a sense of what the rest of Iceland is about in a quick. Okay, now what do we got here? For those of you that stay. I'm going to come back to this for a particular reason a little bit later. But uh, this is the start. Now, the, uh, the trail, it's interesting, the trail way out here, what you're seeing is already coming up. When you're dropped off to do this, you're, as I say, two, three miles away. Uh, what's interesting about this area, this is actually, this is actually privately owned land. Uh, there's a consortium of, you know, Owners, families that go back two or three hundred years, and they own all this land. 
Now the question was, you'll see some rudimentary um, scraping trails that were put in. Uh, we would assume the government did because they don't, nobody's charging to go there. Uh, but those are put in. But the climb is, um, I'm sorry, this is the climb. And you're going on, now these trails look a little better than some you'll be seeing. Continuing up, now pretty much along this area here, uh, the first the first night we're going up, and I was with one of our photographers, a woman who is serious, uh, wonderful photographer, and uh, she's you know got all the the high end Nikon lenses, bodies, including a 600 millimeter tripod. What I'm getting at is that the, you know her backpack probably weighed 40 pounds. But she also had a front pack because she had a, her big lens on it with a tripod. So, you know, going up, and we're going up, as you can see, pretty much uphill most of the way. And we, we had stopped there. And talk, we, we walk along. And, <laughs> and even though I wasn't carrying as much the same equipment, I was <laughs> feeling kind of the same way. And I said to her at the time, I said, we had another half mile to go here. And I said, you know, we go that other half mile, we get to the top. We damn well better see something that made this all worth it. <laughs> That's what we saw. From here, we ended up going down all the way to here. Okay? Now you can see the lava here. This is all lava flow. Okay? So we went down here, and the next series of photographs, there's not going to be a lot, but you can get a sense. The next series of photographs you'll see which taken from that from that vantage point. But I want you to first read this. But read it slowly. Read it slowly, because we're going to come back to some issues here. i got to get you to feel something. I know I'm going to do it, but damn well, you want to read it. Pay attention. Okay, there's just a few that I'm going to. Uh... Now I should point out what what uh, while we while we're here, what made this what has made this up until that point, and we made this volcano special and unique, were three things. Number one, it was relatively small as far as this type of volcano goes, which means that you could. You had reasonable access to it. This volcano is only about 25, 30 miles uh, south of Reykjavik. And you had a good road to get you at least to where you had to hike. So it was accessible. And again, it was also it was not the kind of volcano that's spewing their ash and, and uh, toxic gas. Was spewing there with the, the molten lava permitted you to get, as I said earlier, within a couple of hundred yards. Okay? The other thing, which I probably can't emphasize enough when you talk about frequency of an eruption. Now, just for example, uh, I mean, uh, Old Faithful is a geyser. Old Faithful goes off very reliably, I think it's like 20, 21 times a day, once an hour, okay? Once an hour. Here, you're looking at eruptions that occur every five to 10 minutes. So you're sitting there, you're seeing this, and then you, five minutes later, ten minutes later, you get it again. This is the lava coming down. Now you just saw, we're going to go on to more, you just, you just saw a few. I'm going, this, I'm, I'm going to repeat this. You just saw a few, you read what it is. I just want you to watch it. You're sitting there, there's no cities out there, there's no trains, there's no buses. You're there, you're there watching the earth being reformed. You see it, you hear it, and you're there, you feel it.
you see the people in the foreground, most of the time nobody's talking. It's like a spiritual experience. It really is. Okay, we're going to continue. This is the, uh, the second day. Second day we're going up. We're going a little further this day. In fact, you can see the extended lava fields out there, way up here. You can see that what the trail was here, no trail really, just you know, uh, yesterday, uh, I should say, <laughs> yesterday, the, the one you saw before, we had come from here. Here, that's where we came. What is this now? Remember the frequency of the lava flows. Every five, ten minutes, you're going to see some of the flows. I'll show you the, the amount of lava being generated. Where the hell is it coming from? <laughs> so anyway, we have to obviously reroute. And in this case, we're going up, we're going up here and then down here. Now this part, you can't see it here. You'll see it, I think, in the next scene. You can see the severity of the slope. Going up is one thing. Coming down, uh, you know, a, tri a tripod becomes your walking stick, really, which you need. And this is our camera crew. And look on, uh, apart from looking on your foot, that's what we're walking on for most of that next mile with camera gear, with tripods. And remember, we're going down. It's already the middle of the night. So this is another. This is another area. You can see the lava right above them. This is just to prove that I was there. But you can see on the foot, I mean, that's basically what you're walking on. And now I want to focus on the lava spewing out. So this is the last, last video I want to show you. It's a one minute video. This part here, you're going to see both in, in this and in the stills, the massive flow Every 10 minutes that's coming out of there, you can see the way they're moving. Well, two football fields. You see the way the wind is moving. It's it's an unimaginable unimaginable feeling. I I find this late late in the game. I I really if I start talking about it, I'm there and I get too emotional. I really do. Uh, that's how powerful it is to, to be there. Like. So what we're going to see here, uh, we're, in, we're in another location now. And, okay, here's the people in, in front of us now. Uh, the river, you actually, you, you'll, see the move, you'll see the movement of the lava river. It was interesting, early on, uh, in another area, which I, I don't have here, a couple of days, they had a couple of earth moving equipment. They were hoping to try and change the course of the lava river. And you look at these earth moving equipment, I swear to God, it's like looking at a Tonka toy thing on a, on a beach. And it turned out to be the case, of course. Uh, and you can see we're bundled up. As I said before, it's cold. And this is, you know, you want, the reason you're going later is because you want to get there during the you know, the darkest time where you get the, some of the photos you may have seen had a nice, uh, nice sunset. I see the color in the sky. Uh, the other interesting thing, which I didn't, I didn't get to, just about, the number of people, when we went the first night, the first night was a Saturday night, and there was a lot of, there was a lot of people, virtually all Icelanders. And the reason it was crowded is 
Don't forget, we're going at night time. The next day was Sunday, so they didn't have to work. So there was a lot of them. The next couple of days we went, which were weekdays, there was very few, very few people. Very few. The other point I want to make before I move on in terms of the ice centers, it was remarkable. You know, obviously the culture, whatever, they're remarkable. The people, the Icelanders that were making the trek from kids, children this high, to people older than myself even. And what you see in here, that this area, this is where it would start. Every, again, predictable. Every, you would, first, this would kind of light up. And then you knew this was going to light up. And then you'll see in the next pictures, that begins. That would then begins to flow. Moved up into that next that next uh, level. You can see it's starting to spurt. This they did a close up. That's what you saw in the video. That's pouring out of there. This is on our way back, or you can, you know, you're moving back, but you can still get a sense of the uh, the explosiveness of it. <clears throat> These next ones will show the uh, the lava. And if you, I think, I'm, you know, when they did a thing on 60 Minutes there a couple months ago, they showed them doing cooking hot dogs along the lava, and so you'll see scenes like that. But it's an extensive field of moving. And you can go right up there. You can see uh, this is the ground, the ground right here. Um, and so these photos are taken basically just a few feet away from it. You can see how far the lava extends. Now remember, this was the middle of May. Middle of May. It's kind of more of an artistic look at it than anything. Okay, uh, again, read the first paragraph quickly. Read, read, this, read the second paragraph again slowly. This is the ty these are the type of words I can't speak to you without just the feeling of being there. As I've said before, it's just, uh, it's not describable. I had, uh, if we were going to go a fourth night, which we, uh, we did, we ended up doing something else, I had kind of, <clears throat> I made like a mental commitment to myself that I was going to go with no camera, no phone. Just me, and a, well, a stick to walk. I felt that that would be the ultimate way to really experience a, uh, the birth, the birth of the earth. Some parts being rebuilt, some parts being torn down. It truly, truly felt that way. And I was with. I did a <coughs> at the uh, at the end of our our thing. I, there was a few photographers together. I asked. A, I asked. A, Question. I says, uh, like, give me one word that describes uh, your experience. Now, I should point out that these other photographers, and I, I'm serious about this, would make me look like a couch potato. In other words, the extent of their travels and their accomplishments really transcends so much of certainly what even I've done. And uh, he gave a different one word answer. One, one person who I felt really fit the bill that I just described. You know, without any hesitation, he just simply used the word first. No further discussion, but over the course of the next couple of days, um, got to, you know, we talked more on different things. But then I, you know, I realized that this person who has accomplished so much, seen so much, he couldn't give it a word. This was absolutely uh, a first for him by any standard. Uh, this is not a lava river. 
this <laughs> me flying home and that's Reykjavik at night. And I think that ends it. And I go home and see how the Red Sox are doing. Unless <laughs> somebody has any questions. That's it from here, okay? Now it works. <laughs> Jesus. I'm sorry. If there's any, I'm sorry. Once the explosion really takes off, is the gra is the tremor still happening? Are you feeling that? Under oh yes, yeah, 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 very much so. It's like a constant earthquake. You do. You feel. Well, that's. I. I guess when I. Ray, can you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the question was, can you feel the tremors? The tremors during the after the explosions. Yes, I. I think. What I was trying to emphasize, maybe there is what we can all see it. I mean, National Geographic is going to come out with a. I'm sure you're going to have pictures that make these look like amateurs. Uh, you can see them. Uh, I showed you a video. You, certainly, you can hear it. You can feel it. The feeling is so powerful. The tremors. <laughs> Excuse me. But it's but it's that it's that transcending an experience. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And I think the other thing that does it is. As I said, the other thing, there's not else, nothing else around. You feel like you're in the primordial part of our, of our planet's growth. Yeah? Did you ever worry about your own safety? <laughs> um, it's a, a sensible question. And well, the answer, I, the, the short answer is no. The, the more uh, meaningful answer is, I think not just me. But I think, as I said, we're so caught up in the, in the moments, so caught up in the experience that you didn't think about it. Now, those, when I was talking about the lava flows, I'm two feet away. One time my tripod fell, <laughs> I had to grab the, grab the tripod out. But there, there wasn't that sense because it was like, it was like a transcendental experience. It was like a pilgrimage almost, you felt it. So, uh, no, and the only time we, we did move early, excuse me, we did leave earlier the second night because I mentioned the wind. The winds had changed direction, and um, you get bits of lava. They weren't necessarily big chunks. They weren't hot. But, you know, they're coming your way, and as I say, you've got expensive cameras and lenses, plus your own, <laughs> your own face uh, coming your way. So we had to, you know, we left uh, uh, for that purpose. But the, the article, uh, what happened after that, uh, where the conditions really worsen, and it's it's really worth reading it for that alone to see how much worse it could be. Um, you've you've had precipitation. Yeah, I think the first picture in the New Yorker shows snow on the ground, even though it's after us. Um, but the wind conditions, you get the howling winds. Now you've got, you know, even though you got just lava, but when it's going in your direction, you've got all the debris, all the debris that goes with it. So that becomes uh, that becomes. But yeah, it, I, was, I was amazed. I think we even talked about it after the fact. Why didn't we feel more concerned? Because the reality is, there's no, you know, you don't have guards out there. I mean, this was, you just went. And whatever happened, they did have, I should say, they had, I guess, their version of what we call a ski patrol. We did see a few, I don't know who they represented or whatever, but were, were going around. And because don't forget, some of those, you're on the edge of a precipice, and you get too close to the camera. And, so yeah, but th those things I think we're just so caught up in the spirituality of it that you didn't think about it. Yeah, yeah Dave. What about the smell? Did you uh, have a lot of sulfur? Not a lot, but it was, but it was, it was there. Yeah, it, it was there. Yeah, yeah, very much so. But again, not in a. We, uh, we, I'm trying to think. Actually, we had kind of masks on just to keep us warm. <laughs> was, you know, that's and that's why when I mentioned about the. The explosion, it's really, you know, we're there for hours. Um, and that, again, makes the other point we're talking about the eruptions. You know, if, if you go up and you've got an eruption occurring every hour or so, you're going up there, you're, you're quite chilled. So what do you do? You see one eruption and you wait around for another one. The fact that it was occurring that rapidly, you got a warning every five minutes. You got this big burst. <laughs> and it was, you felt it, but you welcomed it. You absolutely welcome that, that level of heat coming your way, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. How long were you there? Well, we were there two. Well, the the two weeks we were there. The first week was when we did the volcano. 
Oh, you know what I didn't read? I want to read you an updating because we're talking about timing. I did get a. Um, I I keep in touch with uh, with the guy, and this is just from yesterday because I I want to know what's going on because I told you before these are they're unpredictable. Uh, we really did go at the ideal time, but here's here's what he said about it now. This is as of yesterday. Right, there has been no activity from the 18th of September, but gas still coming out of, and some smoke. There have been a lot of earthquakes, way more than before. And remember how I said before was thousands of them, uh, way before, and uh, where you expect they would erupt in a different spot in those areas. Then it goes on and says, which you know from that, the area which was a frequent vantage point for us now surrounded by lava and only accessible by helicopter, but then they go on to warn helicopter pilots to be careful because now you've got more gases coming up and obviously that's more of a danger to flight, which is what happened in the uh, uh, 2010 volcano there. That was an ash type and that's why all the travels were disrupted. So. <laughs> well, I, I would say that's a, it, it hardens. I mean, actually, the lava. I would say basic it hardens. Doesn't mean that it's cool yet. You, as you saw in those photos, you still had some red hot embers going on, even though it would have cooled because it's it's a glass like material. So once the temperature gets below a certain amount, it'll harden. But it doesn't mean that it's <laughs> you know that it's uh, um, cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I turned my phone off, but I have it. I think I think Reykjavik is in the uh, in the forties. I think it showed in the forties, in the forties. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, forties Fahrenheit. Yeah, but it, it it varies. Ray, was there any estimate given as to the tonnage of lava? I have no, I have no clue. But obviously, from the frequency eruption, it's just, uh, it's immense by any standard. But uh, I, I don't, it's already, I believe now, it's already gone to the, to the river. Because that, that, uh, the other, that's the other point worth making is, you know, you look at what's happening in the uh, volcano in the Canary Islands. The only difference between this one here and that one is they got people living there, the villages. The area that we looked at, there's nobody living there. So it was free to flow and eventually to go into the ocean, uh, but nobody was really at you know at risk like you see in the Canary Islands. Yes, sir. Can you oh, John. Talk a little bit about your your camera gear and setting. Uh, <laughs> it's got to be one of those in every bunch. <laughs> uh, but what I will say, John, is I mentioned because of what was involved in the uh, in the hiking and all that, I brought along my mirrorless Olympus. Uh, which, as you know, is lighter, uh, more stable. And I had a whole, I didn't, I didn't bother with any telephoto lens. I just didn't, didn't really need those. Uh, but I did have the wide angle. And uh, uh, the other advantage, although I brought it up, the other advantage of the uh, mirrorless uh, Olympus is it has fabulous image stabilization, both the body and the lens. So you could take photos without having to have the, the tripod set up, or in some cases it wasn't it wasn't appropriate to do it. Uh, but yeah, I took that primarily because of the convenience and the weight uh, the weight of uh, that I would have on it. Okay, if that uh, takes care of me, I'm going to go see what's going on with the Red Sox. <laughs>